Well, it's great to be here. Uh, thanks so much for putting this on. It's particularly good to be in the business school. I work at the Center for Civil Society, and I'll try to bring a perspective um, of civil society that's rather concerned about the excessive power of the market, in fact, the destructive power of the market. It's appropriate, I think, to test these ideas in the business school. The most extreme form of this is probably the famous memo that was written by Lawrence Summers. Larry Summers is the uh, czar for... Uh, Barack Obama uh, on the economy, and you can debate whether he's done a good job in the huge bailout of, of Wall Street. Okay, so the most extreme form of uh, our concerns about the market would probably be the famous memo that was written by Lawrence Summers. He's uh, Barack Obama's economic czar, uh, but in 1991 he was the World Bank chief economist, and it's at that point he wrote the famous memo uh, arguing that the economic logic behind dumping a load of toxic waste in the lowest wage country is impeccable, we should face up to that, and that countries in Africa are vastly underpolluted. Now, Larry Summers, in making this argument, uh, explicitly environmentally racist, some even would argue genocidal, has hinted with this extremist notion that you can solve any problem caused by the market with a market solution. Let's come to the next slide. Um, it's very dubious to argue that we have an underpolluted, an underpolluted uh, southern African climate if CO2 is now recorded as a pollutant because the temperature already is rising by one degree since 1980 and you can see Kilimanjaro already reflecting this uh, uh, climate change problem. And particularly if we look ahead this century, nine out of ten African peasants are likely to lose uh, their means of subsistence according to the UN Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. However, in South Africa, uh, we are just not informed enough about this problem. Uh, in fact, we rank very much at the bottom of the world rankings when they do these studies of awareness about whether climate change is a serious problem. We're even below the United States, uh, which is quite something. <laughs> uh, and one reason, I think, is because the leaders here and around the world had a conscious strategy to keep us uninformed, and that could be very explicitly seen as the cartoonist Sapiro shows. When we hosted in South Africa the World Summit on Sustainable Development in 2002, and when the host country, South Africa, just didn't push the climate as an issue. And there's a very good reason for that. We're one of the worst emitters of CO2 and other greenhouse gases because of our huge coal stocks and our smelting. In fact, let's come to the difference between what the government, the national government in Pretoria, is doing on climate politics and what the climate justice movement, uh, a new movement that's emerged over the past uh, five or six years. We even have a Durban group for climate justice that uh, began in 2004. And amongst the demands first that they took to Copenhagen for the big climate summit is to cut greenhouse gas emissions uh, dramatically. 45% by 2020 is what science demands. And to pay the climate debt, secondly. This is a notion that those who cause the problem have the responsibility to pay for the damage. Polluter pays is another way to put it. And there's about $400 billion a year that's been estimated to be the costs associated with um, the victims of climate change trying to uh, recover from the damages and to, to mitigate climate change. The third is the decommissioning of the carbon markets. And I'll show you why this strategy of trying to let the market move uh, the problem around hasn't worked. We saw, firstly, in the Copenhagen summit in December, uh, an extraordinary uh, arrangement of five leaders, five leaders uh, who are not your normal Western wasps, white Anglo-Saxon Protestants. We have Barack Obama, who's half Luo from Kenya, Jacob Zuma, Zulu from our province, Lula da Silva, the Brazilian, Manmohan Singh from India, and Wen Jibao, the China, Chinese uh, leader. And they signed the Copenhagen Accord on the last day, just secretly, uh, they did it to, to avoid the emissions cuts that all of them, and especially the West, are going to have to make. And the benefits there, and those of you who are race theorists will find this uh, problematic, that the real benefits go to the white-owned fossil fuel and big industries that want to keep emitting, and to wealthy white over-consumers. It's quite an extraordinary scene to have the Copenhagen Accord really confirm uh, climate destruction, especially for, for the African continent. Secondly, we'll come to what is owed, and South Africa, frankly, does owe the rest of Africa a vast climate debt. Uh, that debt because we've, or at least the big industries here, have used much more 
than the environmental space. And that uh, is clear when you look at the emissions per capita, which uh, just below Brazil, because Brazil has the green bar, which is the destruction of the Amazon and, and uh, emissions associated with that, a little bit below the OECD. And then you look at our economic emissions, the emissions intensity, uh, CO2, and that comes again from our huge coal-fired energy production for the benefit of big metal smelters and mining houses. Uh, and there we're uh, just up at the level nearly of China per unit of output, way ahead of the rich OECD countries. Uh, we also can look at uh, climate debt in a scientific way, as uh, a group at the University of California, Berkeley, have done, to assess all the ways in which uh, not just the climate, but other aspects of uh, environmental degradation being caused by excessive consumption by a small, rich community here in South Africa. And the government is in denial about this, not recognizing that South Africa has to actually not just cut the emissions, but pay the climate debt. And one reason is that South Africa has been committed for some years now, since the early 2000s, to displacing this problem, not dealing with it directly, but using the markets, the carbon markets. In fact, uh, Martinez van Skalkweg, who was recently our Minister of Environment and Tourism, and then was uh, downgraded just to Minister of Tourism, didn't go to the Copenhagen summit, and yet somehow has been proposed as one of the leading candidates to head the United Nations climate effort. He's one of the two leading candidates as we speak. And his perspective on the carbon markets was pretty obvious when he spoke to the International Emissions Trading Association a few years ago. He said, an all-encompassing global carbon market regime, which includes all developed countries, is the first and ultimate aim very market-oriented way of dealing with it, as you might expect from a man who was formerly an apartheid spy and then leader of the national party, uh, the more business-oriented party in the government before he merged it into the ANC. But it's now become quite clear, and the New York Times reported on this just a few weeks ago, that the carbon market is a gimmick. Um, it's a gimmick to avoid emissions for the North, but it's also a, 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 a dead end. It's a cul-de-sac. The concept, as the New York Times put it, is in wide disrepute. Obama dropped all mention of cap and trade from his current budget. Why did cap and trade die? The short answer is it was done in by the weak economy, the Wall Street meltdown, determined industry opposition, and its own complexity. And that was uh, amplified by a senator, Maria Cantwell, who added the Enron scandal, an energy scandal, uh, and the rocky start to a carbon credits trading system in Europe that's been subject to a dizzying price fluctuations and widespread fraud. And you can see those price fluctuations, especially with the, uh, let's go to the next slide, with the five distinct crashes that occurred between 2006 when it was up and running uh, and late last year. Uh, crashes that left the carbon market price at around the 10 to 15 euro per ton of carbon, which by all accounts, any engineer will tell you, isn't enough to begin to subsidize the renewable energy that we need to transition uh, away from carbon. The carbon markets come here very close by, in fact, and not far from here in Westville is uh, Clara State. And there we've got the main pilot for South Africa, that is the major b uh, dump in Durban, the, the Basasa Road landfill. In, in fact, it's Africa's largest landfill. As everyone here knows, it's an environmentally racist dump. They put this dump in Clara State, mainly Indian and colored, and, and more recently African community. During apartheid, it was in 1980, and they, they put this huge dump here. They put uh, a medical waste incinerator, many cancer-causing agents uh, in the Basasa Road dump. Um, and then in, instead of closing that dump, as was demanded by the communities, it was kept alive. And one of the key reasons was the World Bank came and said, we'll allow this dump to be a source where the methane, uh, our rubbish rots and becomes methane, can be turned into electricity. And in so doing, we'll see the electricity um, add to the grid, and we'll be able to sell the emissions reductions thus achieved to the World Bank and in turn sell it to the world markets so that the northern corporations can continue their emissions, but they'll buy emissions reductions here at Basasa Road from our very rubbish. Sounds great, right? Not to a woman who lived at the bottom uh, left-hand corner, Sajida Khan. Sajida Khan studied here at the Westville campus in her youth. Next slide. We'll see uh, Sajida Khan here. Um, desperately trying to stop this plant. Unfortunately, the, uh, the, the rubbish dump killed her in 2007. She died of her second uh, dose of cancer from the, the dump. She did, however, uh, quite successfully raise this issue and catalyzed a big global movement. The Durban Group for Ca uh, Climate Justice met in Durban because of her work. Um, 
the Durban dump, uh, the Durban solid waste has indeed continued to market this. They don't have the World Bank's backing because it is so controversial. A real racist example of the clean development mechanism. Uh, but at just 14 euros a ton, it's not really the payoff that's been required. I'll just finish up with a few points, 10 points about the single most controversial aspect of climate politics in which South Africa is united with the World Bank to finance on April 8 a $3.75 billion loan mainly for the Madupi power plant, the fourth largest coal-fired power plant in the world. The critics from civil society, a large coalition, came together not only because this is going to emit 25 to 35 million tons of CO2 equivalents into the air a year. That's higher than 115 uh, different countries uh, will emit. So we're seeing a huge contribution to climate change from this big plant coming up in Limpopo. In addition to uh, the global environment, the next slide, we'll see the local ecologies associated in Limpopo and with the coal mining that's going on in Limpopo and in Pumalonga to feed into this. Forty different um, uh, communities are adversely affected by the new mines that will be uh, developed, and they already have very high sulfur dioxide uh, emissions. They already have a huge problem with water scarcity, and the mining degradation of water is becoming a national scandal. Um, the third problem is the procedural problems associated with the World Bank's own lending because they only started their consultation on this December and they had no one from the communities affected. They lent to a corporation, I think everyone in this room knows that ESCOM is probably the most malgoverned uh, corporation and public enterprise we have with a huge battle that even had the CEO and the chairman uh, fighting each other to their mutual deaths uh, as leaders of that corporation last November. Um, they've lost huge amounts of money and are really not a very good credit risk. So ESCOM is trying to take uh, this plant and make the poor adversely uh, and disproportionately pay uh, the price. And as we know, that was initially 35% price increase. They only got 25% a year for the next three years. Over a four-year period, 127% after inflation. Uh, massive electricity disconnections, ubiquitous service delivery protests have emerged. You can see the signs and the protests are emerging every day, dozens of them, and the threatened national labor strike as a result. And um, as the Bureau has it, the shock that you're going to get as ordinary people when you get these ESCOM bills paying for the Madubi plant in turn to repay the World Bank loan um, will lead to disconnections. In fact, about a third of ESCOM's four million individual customers are recording zero consumption right now because of the disconnection uh, epidemic. And that's led to explicit protests against the high prices and the World Bank loan as well. This one just a few meters from here at ESCOM's headquarters in, in Westville on February 16th. Another reason is that the beneficiaries, if the poor are paying adversely and, and disproportionately the bill, the uh, beneficiaries are the largest mining and metal companies in the world. Sweetheart deals were done in the early 1990s, special pricing agreements, especially with BHP Billiton of Melbourne and Anglo-American of London. And they were getting their electricity, and it depends on the price of aluminium, but it's about 12 cents South African, one and a half US per kilowatt hour. That's for these big smelters. It's about a sixth the price of what households are paying. And that pricing agreement resulted in a 9.7 billion rand loss for ESCOM last year. The ESCOM braggery about the cheapest electricity in the world that they still offer um, reflects that the aluminum smelters, especially up the road in Richards Bay, are taking huge amounts of electricity, over 10%, but giving very little back, half a percentage of GDP, a couple of thousand jobs. And so across the spectrum, people are saying, when will these special pricing agreements and when will these aluminum smelters be phased out? They're not a good deal on any basis, especially when you consider where the profits go. The profits are being sucked out of this country for these biggest corporations, the mining and metals houses, BHP Billiton, Anglo, ArcelorMittal, Extrata, these are all taking their profits to international headquarters. And as a result, we've had extreme pressure uh, on our current account deficit, which is today still one of the highest in the world, and amongst our peer group, amongst the highest. The next slide will show you. The Economist magazine even rated South Africa the world's most risky emerging market just over a year ago. And the ratios of current account between the countries haven't changed since then. South Africa is about the highest still. Because of our current account deficit, that's the profits, dividends, uh, and interest outflow as well as the trade deficit. Uh, and so we are, in a sense, uh, becoming more and more vulnerable because of this. And the vulnerability gets even worse when we consider this is a huge foreign debt that we're taking on, 3.75 billion 
uh, it brings us up to about $80 billion. The costs are extremely high. These, uh, this foreign debt has now reached the point where, if you remember, P.W. Borta uh, encountered a debt crisis in 1985 in terms of debt as a percentage of the economy. Uh, and that debt crisis came because uh, the apartheid regime had overborrowed. Well, the post-apartheid re regime has, has, has overborrowed too, but not for good uh, purposes. And it's for white elephants, for big stadiums that we're only going to use a few times uh, uh, in June and July. And this uh, huge foreign debt becomes harder and harder for us to repay because of the currency crashes. South Africa's had more currency crashes over the past 15 years than any major country. Uh, six, uh, five cur uh, currency crashes, 1996, 98, 2001, 2006, 2008, where the rand has fallen 15%. So when the rand falls and we have foreign debt, we have to pay back in rand that is worth less, and the effective interest rate goes very, very high as a result. These are all the reasons we shouldn't have borrowed in foreign currency for this loan. We've also got increased privatization pressure coming from the World Bank for the renewables part of the loan, which has been described as a fig leaf. But uh, we're also seeing a 49% private investment in the next big power uh, 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 generator, Kosile. The unions have said, we will just not allow this. So there's a huge conflict with the trade unions coming up as well. And finally, the, nearly finally, the most uh, notorious part of the loan is the um, corruption associated with the African National Congress, our ruling party, having a stake, 25%, in Hitachi, which got um, a 40 billion rand contract for, for boilers for this and for the next uh, big power plant. So this huge uh, pay payola, really, it's, it's a bribe. In fact, it was deemed improper by a state agency that the chair of ESCOM, Vali Musa, formerly the, the environment minister, was also on the ANC Finance Committee. And it's become quite a scandal that the World Bank itself is rather embarrassed by, but they went ahead even knowing this and made the loan, knowing that the ruling party will benefit dramatically from it. This really goes along with the World Bank history of promoting apartheid back then, class apartheid today. Back then, they made $100 million between 1951, just three years after apartheid's National Party came into power, and 1966, when South Africa stopped borrowing because it was too wealthy. At that point, $100 million for expanding South Africa's electricity system. How many black South Africans benefited from that? Exactly, zero, because no blacks had electricity. White South Africans, white corporations, did very well by the World Bank. Apartheid was empowered by the World Bank. And the Jubilee Movement, Jubilee South Africa, said, uh, that there should be reparations paid by the World Bank to the victims of apartheid as they've asked for big corporations. That brings us back to what should be done with the World Bank. Well, it should be obvious. Take away their money. They don't know how to spend it properly. They're investing in destroying the climate and increasing inequality and helping the biggest corporations get their profits out of the country, making us less stable. Um, so they're asking now for $86 billion and civil society across the world is saying, no, no, don't give it to them if you want to save the planet. In addition, what should we be doing here? It's pretty obvious. Instead of taking 40 new coal mines and producing huge amounts of new electricity for BHP Billiton and Anglo to take out of the country, we should leave the coal in the hole. Here I'll take Al Gore's advice and share it with you. He said, uh, it was quoted in the New York Times, I can't understand why there aren't rings of young people blocking bulldozers and preventing them from constructing coal-fired power plants. A good question for South Africans. When will we stop? the construction of Madupe, Kusile, and the other coal-fired power plants that the government wants to bring online. Finally, it, it does bring to, together that campaign against the World Bank, 65 groups in South Africa, 200 around the world, fighting against that loan. The loan went ahead on April 8. Um, but this is a broad movement of community, of environment, of labor, of a variety of groups, churches as well, who said, we've really got to bring together the kind of concerns of the environment and of social justice and generate a climate justice movement. So unlike in 2002 at the World Summit on Sustainable Development, where we had greens on one side and reds on the other, greens concerned about the environment, reds about social justice, we need a nice fusion. And that's the fusion that we're going to have to have in civil society. I hope I've made the case. We have to do this work because the elites are certainly not going to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Thank you.